sure this is on. Um, Leonard Marcus is going to speak first, and as our, I'm sorry? Like this? Oh, thank you. Um, I'm Donna Seaman, an editor at Booklist, and I've been asked, I don't know, to just sort of join the party um, with Leonard Marcus and Audrey Niffenegger. And Leonard is going to speak first. Um, I'm sure um, you've been familiar with his books and looked at his latest, Minders of Make Believe, which is such a great phrase. So I'm going to give the podium to Leonard, and then Audrey um, will speak, and then we'll have a conversation among the three of us and among all of you. Thank you so much. No, no, I have a microphone. Oh, okay. <laughs> he has a mic. Yeah, okay. Well, good morning. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the people who are behind the scenes in the world of children's books. Um, most of us um, have a, a, a sort of intimate or, or private relationship to children's literature. Uh, we remember certain books that uh, our parents read to us growing up. We maybe are particularly fond of certain books that we've read to our own children. But for most of us, um, our knowledge and um, interest of children's books um, ends at that point, um, as it were, in the foreground of our lives. And uh, it's very rare for people to step back and think about children's books as having um, a connection to the rest of, of our culture, to think of um, the, the writing of children's books as part of the tradition of literature, and the illustrations in children's books as part of the tradition of art. So my work is to try to make those connections in the various things that I write. Um, and um, in writing uh, the book Minders of Make Believe, the minders I have talked about are, first of all, um, in addition to the writers and illustrators of the books, going back 300 years, um, also the publishers of the books, um, the editors and others who've worked in the, in the actual making of the books and sending them out into the world. Also the critics who have commented on them and have decided for their time um, what was a good children's book and what was not a good children's book. There's never been a time in America going back to the colonies um, when um, getting children to read wasn't considered a very important thing to do. But the reasons that people have thought that that was important and the books that they've put in their children's hands have varied enormously depending on people's philosophies and understanding of childhood. Um, I think the reason um, that children's books um, are part of our culture is because in each generation, uh, the adults of that time um, set down uh, their wishes and dreams, really, for the people of the next generation. They put it into the primitive form of print and pass it on to their children. And so children's books are almost like messages in bottles uh, tossed into the ocean of the culture in the hope that uh, later generations will find these messages and, and keep them alive. Um, now I thought I would talk a little bit, um, oh, I, and I should mention in addition to the critics and the, and the publishers, also librarians and educators and religious leaders and parents, um, and children themselves have all been minders, what I call minders of make-believe, the people who've had a say in deciding which were the good children's books in their time. So I, I thought I would um, talk a little bit about some of the ways that children's books have mattered to Americans at different times in our past, and then read you uh, one or two brief excerpts from my book. Um, the very first children's book published in North America uh, appeared in, in 1690 in, in Boston. It was a work of uh, religious fervor. Uh, it, was a, it was an expression of Puritan New England. And um, in those days, um, when children could die at a very young age, um, the um, people who lived in, in the Massachusetts colony um, wanted their children to learn to read as early as possible. And their reason for wanting that was so that their children could read the Bible and attend to the, um, the state of their soul to prepare for salvation. Um, the Puritans cast a very long shadow over American children's books because even when the American population became a lot more diverse and not everybody had that same religious orientation, uh, still um, the Puritan um, fear and loathing, you might say, of fiction 
as a, as a digression or departure from the word of the Bible um, was, was felt. And as a result, uh, there was a lot of um, skepticism about the value of fiction for children, uh, that it was a distraction from the serious business of growing up. Uh, I'll tell you in a minute when that began to change. Um, in the years after the American Revolution, um, people who were making children's books were interested in nation building. And children's books became very important in creating a, a new pantheon of American heroes that children could look up to. That story which I grew up with, and perhaps you did too, of uh, little George Washington chopping down his father's cherry tree and then going up and uh, fessing up to his uh, mischief, I cannot tell a lie, was a fabrication. It was in itself a lie uh, made up by a man named Mason Weems, uh, a fellow from Philadelphia who was part evangelist, part huckster, um, someone who I think inspired um, P.T. Barnum, a man of the next generation, uh, to go out and make hay um, in the culture of childhood. Um, and he, uh, among other things, wrote a biography of George Washington, which became one of the most widely read books in America at the beginning of the 19th century. One of the uh, young people who read that book and was inspired by it was Abraham Lincoln. Um, <clears throat> Now, the Civil War was a really crucial time in American history, in part because um, it was such an incredibly violent event in the lives of Americans. So many families were touched by it uh, personally uh, that it, it led to um, a rethinking of what children's books should be like. Up until then, um, many, many of the children's books that were published were, um, were moralistic in tone. There would be the story of a good boy and a bad boy. It was very clear which was which. Um, after the Civil War, um, the moralists who were responsible for creating these books for children were less sure of themselves. Um, they weren't so sure what was right and what was wrong. Human behavior seemed to be more complicated than that. And that was when the door first opened to fiction in America for children in a big way. And stories like Tom Sawyer uh, could become popular where a mischievous boy who hero in some ways was a bad boy could not nonetheless uh, be the hero of the tale. And it also led to the occasional uh, story about other worlds and utopian worlds, uh, one of which, of course, was the world of Oz, a Chicago story. Um, <clears throat> well, um, one more change that I'll tell you about before I um, give you um, a glimpse of, of my book uh, happened um, in, in, at the turn of the century. And Chicago, again, played a major role, uh, this being the home of the American Library Association. Um, at the turn of the last century, um, there was a great deal of um, concern about the state of um, children's lives in America. Um, society was changing very rapidly. People were moving to cities. Um, there was a great disruption of, of what had been um, traditional life up until then. And lots of people began thinking about um, how children were faring in all this change and turmoil. Um, and so um, child labor laws were passed at that time. And there was better, better uh, medical care being given to children and concern for that. School hours were being, in school um, life was being extended uh, for all children so they would get more education before they were sent out into the big bad world. And librarians um, began to wonder whether they had a role to play also. Um, in the late 19th century, there were public libraries around America which posted signs out front saying no dogs or children allowed. Um, librarians weren't sure whether uh, short people who made noise and had sticky fingers were a good thing or not uh, to let in their doors. But the reform uh, impulse went out, and librarians decided that, in fact, they did have a lot to offer in the way of education and uh, just making life better for the millions of America's children. And so when Andrew Carnegie um, gave millions of dollars for the construction of, of new public libraries all around America, each one of them had a special room uh, devoted um, to children. Um, now, these librarians became the new tastemakers and judges of what were the best books for children. They created um, awards that we've all heard of, the Newbery and the Caldecott Medal, as a kind of signal to parents and to everyone which were the best books each year. They created um, Book Week, which is, was an annual holiday, uh, which was another way of getting everyone's 
parents focused on, uh, on reading for children. Um, and um, they um, formed a new um, coherent market uh, that publishers um, took note of. And it was only after the public libraries began offering service to children all around America that publishers in America uh, began to hire special editors, specialists who were children's book editors. Today we take it for granted that every big publishing company has a children's book division. But, but that only started after the librarians um, became so interested in children's books. Um, and another group um, at the same time as this was happening who began to have a big say were the progressive educators of the 19 uh, teens and 20s. Lucy Mitchell, the founder of Bank Street, came from Chicago. Her father was Otto Sprague, uh, the co-founder of Sprague and Warner, the company that later became General Foods. And he was one of the benefactors who created the University of Chicago and was partly responsible for bringing John Dewey here um, to teach. And Lucy Mitchell was based in New York and she created the Bank Street College um, and began to question in, um, in that wonderfully uh, forthright and adamant way that people in the 20s and 30s had when they were sure of themselves um, whether the librarians were really um, on the right track in terms of what were the good books for children or whether, as she believed, um, they were sentimental old fools and, and, and that their, their books really needed to be um, set aside their ideas for the, the new ones which um, modern science, modern social science um, uh, was pointing toward. Um, well, um, I'll just say um, to go beyond this that um, during the Great Depression, um, some of the gains that had occurred in the years leading up to it um, uh, were, were discarded. Um, the first thing that publishers did when they needed to cut back in economic hard times were some of those um, editorial jobs for children's books. Um, and there's been a, a real theme in American history of, um, of, of, of taking uh, the things of ch uh, children's culture less seriously and thinking that perhaps they were the first, they would be the first things to go almost as if they were frills rather than necessities tied the, to the future of our, of our culture. Um, but um, nonetheless, um, many good books were published for children during the Depression. Um, and I thought I would read to you um, a passage about one of them, which um, I think illustrates the point that the children's books of any generation are uh, reflections of the adult world's um, values and, and have meaning for the children of their time. And this has to do with Laura Ingalls Wilder, uh, who was a writer of the Depression years. Um, some fiction published for older children uh, had special appeal for Depression era Americans. Little House in the Big Wood, the first of Laura Ingalls Wilder's autobiographical novels of American frontier life, held up the struggles for survival of an earlier generation of pioneers as implicit proof that Americans proved uh, possessed the moral strength and determination to weather any adversity. Wilder's elaborately detailed accounts of campfire building, butter churning, and other, one might have thought tedious, frontier routines and chores highlighted not only the pioneers' bare-knuckled resourcefulness and adaptability, uh, but also their capacity for joy, even under the most trying circumstances. Here was a close-knit family that had made the most of a rugged, frail-free life, premised on hard work, stick to and self-reliance. Americans of the 1930s could only hope to do as well. The Wisconsin-born writer's advanced age at the time of authorship, Wilder was 65 when Harper published her first novel, added to the mystique surrounding her first book, underscoring as it did the triumphant nature of her family's survival down to the present day. Strikingly, the 1933 Pulitzer Prize for History was awarded posthumously to Frederick Jackson Turner, the University of Wisconsin scholar whose writings on the closing of the American frontier, first published in the 1890s, argued for the pioneering life's pivotal role in the formation of the nation's democratic values. Urbane, jazz age 1920s intellectuals and writers had had little more than a patronizing smirk for America's buckskin-clad forebears. What a difference a depression made. <laughs>
Um, now, I thought I would, um, do I have a few more? Yeah, um, just fast forward, um, since we've all, one way or another, lived through the Harry Potter phenomenon, and, and read to you a little bit about that, to give you a flavor for how something that you know, we've all experienced in the foreground can be viewed in a, in a more historical light, too. Um, and I'm, I'm just reading part of this, and it takes up where, where the third of the, of the um, series uh, appear. The arrival of the third Harry Potter book set off grumblings among adult trade publishers who feared losing yet another slot on the New York Times all-important bestseller list. <laughs> Within months of Harry's appearance on the cover of Time over the banner headline, the magic of Harry Potter, hero of three bestsellers, he's not just for kids. The New York Times, in an effort to make the world safe for Danielle Steele and Tom Clancy, <laughs> moved to isolate Rowling by introducing a separate list devoted to juveniles. Children's book advocates generally praised the decision, noting that the new list was sure to give greater public exposure to many other less widely heralded but equally worthy books in addition to Rowling's. But to some, the move seemed an embarrassing face-saving exercise and a final refusal to concede that children's books might in fact occupy a significant place in the cultural mainstream. The outsized success of the books made them a lightning rod for attacks for many quarters. In the wake of the Times announcement, Harold Bloom, writing in the pages of the Wall Street Journal, offered a damning critique of an author whose books, surreally, he boasted of not having actually read in their entirety. <laughs> Taking up arms against Harry Potter at this moment, Bloom began, is to emulate Hamlet taking up arms against a sea of troubles. <laughs> Four columns of fine print later, the Yale professor concluded, the cultural critics will soon enough introduce Harry Potter into their college curriculum, and the New York Times will go on celebrating another confirmation of the dumbing down it leads and exemplifies. The predictable backlash also included public library challenges initiated by fundamentalist religious uh, Christian groups who objected to the author's references to witchcraft and at least one baseless legal claim that Rowling had stolen the idea for the series from the obscure works of another writer. Meanwhile, scholars did, as Bloom had predicted, begin to offer undergraduate courses, convene conferences, and publish their proceedings. In circles of ambitious parents everywhere, the secular equivalent of medieval miracle tales made the rounds with improbable reports of the precocious four or five-year-old who had somehow mustered the concentration and stamina to read one of the rolling tomes cover to cover independently. The author's tales of preternaturally capable young wizards and rapacious death eaters in their midst, well suited in age of fantastically high parental expectations and equally exaggerated parental fears. The Potter phenomenon, as it came to be called in the media, discredited some of the adult world's most basic assumptions about young children's reading habits. Until then, it had been widely assumed by publishers, librarians, and educators that few boys cared to read works of fantasy, that few pre-teen boys were truly avid readers in any genre, and that none but the special child of either sex would voluntarily tackle a book of any description <coughs> that was much more than 200 pages long. As Scholastic left increasingly little to chance, by the third book, no advance review copies were made available to the media. Other publishers wondered how best to capitalize on the excitement. Green Willow, a longtime American publisher of British fantasy, took the opportunity to reissue uh, several of the earlier works of Diana Wynne Jones. More than a few houses became newly willing to entertain proposals for multi-book fantasy series. The longer the book had now seemed, the better. Now, news that a Potter film deal was in the works stoked the fire of what, after a time, had clearly assumed the character of a craze. A publishing bubble to rival the 1990s stock market bubble gener generated by internet-based internet new technologies. Yet there was still something genuinely touching about the public response to the Potter books themselves. During the early days of the summer of 2000, in the run-up to the release of the fourth volume, Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, bookstores all around the country announced plans for late-night book parties to be held on the strictly controlled official release date of Saturday, July 8th, 
when copies of the book would go on sale at precisely one minute past midnight. Children dressed as their favorite character arrived at the stores to be greeted by booksellers in dark robes and tall pointy hats. In retail spaces temporarily transformed into festive wizard balls through the addition of faux cobwebs, buckets of misproducing dry ice, and with tables of refreshments. Not since Gone with the Wind has a best-selling book swept the nation the way Harry Potter has, the Times wrote later that day. Barnes & Noble reported having sold 114,000 copies of the new book in the first hour. The great success of the book parties, which collectively counted as the most widely observed, cel observed celebration of reading in the nation's history, seemed a bright spot in an otherwise grim time of politicians' dubious professions of concern for childhood literacy and corporate America's relentless drive to make consumers of even the youngest children. At 732 pages, Rowling's fourth installment was also the longest one by far. Yet eight, nine, and 10-year-olds eagerly lined up for the chance to rise to the challenge. If there was no magic in any of this, it was nevertheless an extraordinary moment, one that none of the experts in children's literature, past or present, librarians, publishers, educators, booksellers, or critics, could have imagined, let alone planned. The gatekeepers of culture and commerce had been taken by storm. Children, it seemed, had once again made their choice. Thank you. Um, I just want to read a quote uh, from Leonard Bernstein, the great conductor, composer, and author, renowned for welcoming young people into Orchestra Hall and um, opening up the world of music to them. I think this is sort of a good transition between um, Leonard's discussion of the people uh, that tried to bring children's books to children and to Audrey Neppenegger, an artist and writer. Because um, we're going to sort of be more atmospheric, I believe. <laughs> so that's what the good Leonard Bernstein had to say. Any great work of art is great because it creates a special world of its own. It revives and readapts time and space and the measure of its success is the extent to which it makes you an inhabitant of that world, the extent to which it invites you in and lets you breathe its strange and special air. And on that note, I'd like to introduce Audrey Neffenegger. And I want to mention, um, as Audrey goes to the podium, that in addition to her beautiful books, The Three Incestuous Sisters and The Adventurous, her novel, The Time Traveler's Wife, much of which is set in the Newberry Library, as I'm sure you all know. Um, Audrey's also currently serializing a story in pictures in The Guardian um, in London, the newspaper. And you can see this online. And it's very beautiful. It, too, has sort of a library echo. Very library-esque. Thank you. Um, I have to apologize for all the clutter on the screen. I was having a big arm wrestling match with my computer and I lost. <laughs> so, uh, so we're going to look at this in my photo. So it's, um, hopefully you can see it okay. Um, when, when the excellent folks from the Menendez Fest contacted me about being on this program, they said, do you have any connection with golden books? And I said, well, I cut them up and I use them in collage. <laughs> they're like, great, fabulous. You're on. Um, so, uh, Giving it further thought um, and, and reading this book, I decided that the thing to do was to think about my own uh, beginnings as a, as a child reading illustrated books and, um, and how that <coughs> made me an artist and how it impacted the sort of art that I do. So this is a fairly impressionistic uh, tour of some of my art. I've left out, you know, the dismemberment and, and all the sex, <laughs> and, you know, that sort of thing in, in favor of my more uh, whimsical creations, um, and tried to match them up somewhat directly with, with the things I was looking at when I was a kid. Um, so this is a painting called Bad Fairy, and that's, that's me. <laughs> Um, so my connection to Golden Books is really a particular kind of Golden Book, these, these wonderful little uh, manuals that 
teach you all about weather and cats and mammals and insects and that sort of thing. And I, I buy these things by the tens. I go to used book sales and just buy them in bushels and um, and then I chop them up and do this sort of thing with them. Um, so like, you know, I'm, I'm stealing the bats and the butterflies and the snakes and so forth. Um, this is, uh, it's called self-portraitism do so. So it's all very wholesome. And um, the, the attraction of the Golden Books is that they have this wonderful um, authoritative and, and sort of neutral style of illustration that is very easy to suck up into other drawings and collages. And so um, collage over the years has, has subverted all sorts of printed matter and so this is just me um, doing things with the golden books that their creators never imagined. <laughs> Um, I did a series recently, um, Isabella Blow, the great um, British fashion muse, uh, died last year, and I decided to do an entire show devoted to her memory. And so this is a little series called Hats for Isabella Blow to Wear in Heaven. Um, she's especially famous for her association with Philip Treacy, who's a London uh, milliner and who made all these insane hats. You must look this up. Um, Phyllis Tracy and Isabella Blow. So I made her some hats also. This is her snake hat. And her watermelon hat. These are all sucked out of the Golden Books. Um, this was so easy that I almost feel ashamed of myself for calling it my own art. But, um, butterfly hats. And, and in a way, these are kind of like the hats that Philip Tracy made for her. And so if I could somehow make the actual hats myself out of Golden Books, I would do it. But it doesn't, it doesn't quite translate. This is other sorts of collage that I've done. Um, this is more directly Max Ernst-like. Uh, he did several collage novels, um, mostly taken from illustrated newspapers. <coughs> this is more of his style. Uh, I also take old books and do things to them. Um, I have a friend, Diane Thodos, who, uh, who makes book boxes. She takes real books and she cuts out the contents and lines them with velvet so you can store your pod and your keys and stuff. And, um, or, you know, whatever. Real, real nice stuff, passports. So anyway, so she gives me all her bits and pieces and I make stuff out of them. Um, so I wanted to show you some of the people that I was looking at when I was tiny and I thought I would start with uh, Marguerite D'Angeli who did an illustrated book of nursery and Mother Goose rhymes. This was published by Doubleday in 1953. And I loved to look at this when I was really tiny because it was so scary. Um, the rhyme that goes with this is about this woman who goes to market and she gets tired along the way and she sits under a tree and falls asleep. And this bad, bad man comes along with his scissors. I don't know how well you can see that, but he's got his scissors in his hand and he cuts off her skirts. And she wakes up, and she freaks out, and this is the really strange thing about it. She doesn't know if she is herself, because she has not got a skirt on, and so she thinks to herself, well, if I am me, my little dog will know me when I go home. And so she goes home, and her little dog barks and barks, and she thinks, oh my god, I'm not me. It's the strangest thing in the world. It made no sense to me whatsoever then, it doesn't matter. <laughs> But the, the look on his face, you know, that kind of sideways glance and the scissors, and oh, it was so scary and weird. And I loved it, you know, I loved feeling like that. And I thought, you know, wow, you know, this, is, this is good <laughs> and weird. Um, this is another illustration from the same book. And all of, all of her things have this creepiness factor that is just fantastic. Um, and this is this witch who's flying around in this basket. Or I don't know what she's up to. She's just you know, flying around. And I don't know if this is you know, the image that generated this lifelong obsession of flying and levitation, but certainly it, it keys into all that. Um, this is, this is a, a painting called Moths in the New World. And you know, this idea that one might turn into a creature is also big with me. So winged things, floating things, levitating things. Uh, this is just me being Mary Poppins. Um, the actual painting is called Bad Luck, and it's about this idea that if you open an umbrella indoors, you get bad luck. But 
I've taken to calling it the Mary Poppins painter. Um, but anyway, yeah, you know, just anything to do with magic. Um, this, this idea of dreaming is always big with me. These, the, all these children's books that, that have inexplicable things that happen, that was so great. I mean, I think children are natural anarchists <laughs> and opportunists. And so what I was always looking for was that thrill of weirdness. You know, I just, you know, if I had been little when Harry Potter came along, I would have just, I love it now, but I would have just totally died for it then because it's, it's the unification of weirdness with the everyday that is so great. Um, I did a book called The Three Incestuous Sisters, which miraculously has been published in a trade edition, and they have them sitting over there on this table, which still blows my mind. It took me 14 years, and it was all made by hand. It's, it's aquatint. And um, so these are a few images from that. But it's, it's sort of shaming, in a way, to discover that you are making the same images over and over again. I mean, I didn't think I was doing that, but apparently, uh, and my, my obsessions are stronger than I knew. But yeah, this is not a children's book. <laughs> this is called He Read Her Mind Like a Book. <laughs> this, is, this is where one of the three ancestor sisters rescues her nephew from being imprisoned in this circus. This is, again, I'm obsessed with superstition and bad luck, so this is uh, one of the sisters tripping over a black cat. <laughs> Um, again, we've got the levitation thing. This is called Life Underground. I can't explain it, it's just there. <laughs> um, I've also got this thing with death, and I don't know that I can really blame that on children's books, but uh, certainly in fairy tales, there's always this, this threat, you know, that the characters are going to die, be eaten, or just, you know. Fairy tales are full of weirdness, they're, they're really rich that way. I've you know, got this never ending death thing. This is called, uh, he sings a little song of the moon. It is like the roar of the sea in a shell. And this is this weird game I had that I, I ran into my grandmother being carried around on the dining room table after she had died. Um, and I think. You can blame Lewis Carroll for lots of things, <laughs> so I will. Um, one of the fantastic things in Alice is how her body is continually distorting and transforming. And the, the continual estrangement of Alice from her body is something that really resonated for me, and I think for many young girls, you know, and I'm sure young guys, I just can't speak to it, but this, this feeling that you're growing, and that's weird. Um, is, is something that I got out of the Alice books. Um, also this feeling that you're too big all the time. So, uh, so in, my, in my work there's a lot of disparity of scale and things just being somehow wrong that way. Um, another book which no one seems to have heard of, but which I love, love, and still reread, is called No Flying in the House. Uh, the author was Betty Brock, and the illustrations were by Wallace Tripp. Um, this one is about a, a three-year-old girl who shows up at the home of a very rich lady who, in the company of a three-inch tall talking dog named Gloria. Um, and Gloria later turns out to be a fairy, and the girl, Annabelle, is taken in by the rich lady because the rich lady likes the dog. And um, it's way more complicated than that, but at any rate, the, the little girl discovers by accident that if she kisses her elbow, she can fly. Um, and I can't tell you how exciting that was and how much I tried, <laughs> but uh, it never, it never worked out. Uh, Peter Pan, also fabulous and, and very important to me. Um, this particular version of Peter Pan, oh, where'd you go? Where did the illustration? Ah, okay. This is an, a Random House edition from 1957. The illustrations are by Marjorie Torrey. And uh, I'm also very attached to the 19th century because so much of what I was reading was English, 19th century stuff. Um, I have to also give a shout out to my, my parents, particularly my mother, because we had just boatloads of books in the house. And my mother was very wise and, and artistic in what she chose for us to read. But, uh, anyway, yeah, there's always, there's always a 
voting girls. and the things with wrong heads. So, uh, this is an illustration from the Patchwork Girl of Oz, uh, obviously by L. Frank Baum. This particular book was illustrated by John R. Neal. It came out in 1913. Uh, this is not for children. This is uh, Max Klinger uh, and Henshua, which is a series of etchings that chronicle the adventures of this long white glove. And uh, this is one of those things where you go to the library and you roam away from the children's stacks and, and find your way into the art room where you're not supposed to be. Um, and I started doing that a lot, you know, because the forbidden thing is always good. So, monsters, monsters. This is actually kind of a test run for a story that I'm writing about a little girl who has hypertrichosis, which means you're completely covered with fur, hair. And uh, anyways, I'm writing about her adventures, and I thought I would try to make a picture of her. Yeah, endless, endless animals doing odd things. Also, many images of people reading. And, you know, the odd woman riding around on a turtle. <laughs> And again, this is from Sisters. One of the things that interests me is the difference between what you can say with an image and what you can say with words. And image things are, I think, I think you pack more punch. You get at some part of people's brains that they can't necessarily describe. And it means things that people can't always pin down. And I find that very powerful. And this thing for birds in general and crows in particular. The Peter Pan thing was huge with me. This was my first crush. I mean, I think I was eight or something, and I just had this huge thing for Peter Pan. And, uh, Later I realized that it wasn't really Peter that was exciting, actually Wendy was exciting. <laughs> to be Wendy and fly around with all the crazy lost boys. Um, this is from The Adventurous, um, which is a book that I started making when I was in art school. I worked on it from when I was, I think I started when I was 19 and finished when I was 21. And it was, um, it was my sort of thesis project. And I discovered in doing it this way of, of working so that the text sort of, it was like a little sheepdog. It would direct you and move you around, but the images were really carrying the story, which was interesting and exciting to me. Uh, this is called 19th Century Hair. And this obsession with things on your head. I don't know what that means. Uh, this is called Nest. Uh, Harriet the Spy. Just everybody who's like a devotee of Harriet the Spy, like changed your life. Yeah. <laughs> Louise Fitzhugh is a genius, and one of the things that I especially love, love about these books, not only was this character like running amok in Manhattan, <laughs> but the illustrations and the words were coming from the same person. And that was really important to me because I was getting all these messages that you have to be one thing, you know, and, and you have to like decide what you're gonna do and then like be a writer or be, you know, whatever it is you are, an accountant. And I kept thinking, no, that can't be right. And there's gotta be a way out of that. And so the Louise Fitzhugh thing was just great. There's also a fantastic description at the beginning of Harry the Spy about how to go about writing a novel. I mean, just the first few pages of Harriet the Spy, she's just like laying out how you make characters and how you do it, and I'm just like, wow, yeah, I can do that. Um, her second book, which is a sequel to Harriet the Spy, is called The Long Secret, and that one is even stranger. 
Um, Harry the Spy came out in 1964, The Long Secret in 1965. I was born in 1963, and so when I came along, this aesthetic, you know, was still pretty current, but it was turning into the 70s. And so it still had this feeling of, of reality, but different reality than the one I was in. I mean, I was growing up in Evanston. This was <coughs> New York people, and they seemed awfully fancy and far away. Um, the other thing which I loved about Louise Fitzhugh, her drawing was much looser than what I was used to in children's books. And so I started to think, well, there's more than one way to do this, which was very appealing. And then, of course, there's Henry Darger, not working for children, <laughs> not working for anybody but his own self, and not following the rules. Um, the reason I picked this out of all possible Henry Darger, um, he was an outsider artist, lived in Chicago, and was generating a lot of his imagery by tracing children's illustration advertisements that featured children. He was, he was making things in this weird way that made them look weird. And the first time I ever saw this, I was 15 years old, I was in high school, and I, just, I went to the MCA, and there was this thing, no explanatory anything. And I just looked at this, and I'm like, my god, he's making his own book, and he's, he's strange. <laughs> and that was awfully encouraging, and still a lot of stuff. Um, also, Lynn Ward. This is a wood engraving from God's Man, uh, which came out in 1929 and was a word <coughs> and You can totally throw the words out the window, tell the story with pictures, which was a revelation. Um, and then, when I was 14, I got an earache and had to stay home from school for two weeks. And my mother brought me this giant stack of books. With, and in that stack was Brian Reed's book on Aubrey Beardsley. Not for children, and so fascinating, and the line quality, and, and the, the otherworldliness of it, uh, and, the, and the obscenity, all good. Um, <laughs> I'm just showing a couple tiny, tiny bits of Beardsley, but um, there was just so much in it that I wanted. I mean, I, I immediately set out to just imitate him completely, just slavishly, and uh, he sort of had a lasting um, this was for a project that my gallery print works did where we were all asked to make book plates for some other person, so I made one for him. Um, this is the only thing I've done which you can even remotely call a children's book, and it cost $12,000, and it's made in an edition of 50. Uh, it's part of a book called Poisonous Plants at Table, and my contribution was a short story called uh, Prudence, a cautionary tale. It's about this little girl who is an anorexic. She doesn't like to eat, so she ends up in a coma. And so the illustrations are what happens to her in the coma, where she's being visited by this messenger who keeps inviting her to the parties that the local dead people are having. And it's all the things that they're feasting on, which are mentioned in the larger book. And so they have all these seasonal parties. And she never will eat anything at these parties. I was refusing whatever nice thing they're having made out of business stuff. But she gets a little more interested and a little thinner with every season. This is fall. Until finally she gets the final invitation and consents to have a little sip of wine which kills her properly, so she can be a proper dead person with the rest of them and have, you know, fun at the picnic. So, you know, probably not suitable for children, but at least, you know, there's no sex in it. <laughs> and the other person I want to mention is Windsor McKay, um, who I suppose not that many modern children know about, but did fantastic comic strips for children um, back in the day. I think it ran from 1905 to 1913. Uh, anyway, so Thanksgiving, uh, where the turkey comes and stomps on everything, takes over the houses and all that. And uh, I think about him a lot because I'm working on a comic strip for The Guardian, as um, Don mentioned, and so he did innovative things in the layout that I still think of. And 
uh, this is a tale of a young woman who finds that she has her own personal bookmobile that only appears at night and contains everything she's ever read. And so this is just a little shelf that shows signs of some of her childhood books, which are, of course, my childhood books. And so there you go. Thank you. That was terrific. Um, since I left my chair down there, I'll, I'll start the questions here and we'll open it up to the audience in a moment. Um, I just wanted to quote from Leonard's book. Um, he has a great line from E.B. White, which I think addresses the idea um, that reading should be good for children and positive, like vitamins or warm clothes, but that children are very drawn to the scary and the creepy, the sort of things um, Audrey's drawn to. Um, but E.B. White, a great children's writer, and when he was, before he'd been published as a children's writer, he was working on Stuart Little, Leonard tells us. And um, in a letter he says, my fears about writing for children are great. One can so easily flip into a cheap sort of whimsy or cuteness. I don't trust myself in this treacherous field unless I am running a degree of fever. <laughs> and I wanted to ask, um, I guess starting with you, Leonard, about um, that sort of deadly cuteness and earnestness that occurs in children's literature and what children really like. And since we're, it's just after Halloween, I'm thinking of the huge popularity of R.L. Stein's Goosebox. Sure. Um, I think there's always been a, um, a, um, a high tradition of children's books, uh, of approved books, and a kind of underbelly tradition. And almost invariably, the, the underbelly books are the ones that are the ones that most children seem to gravitate toward um, in the 1930s when comic books were new. Um, they sold in the millions, you know, whereas children's books that were winning um, Newbery medals were um, much less popular than that. Um, R.L. Stein is, is probably a good example from our own time of a popular kind of fiction which um, children have just eaten up, but which were um, less slower to make it up onto the shelves of the public libraries. But I, I think there's really been a shift in, in the sensibility of the, of the minders of children's books in recent times, um, partly because um, books are less central to our culture in general, and there's so many other things competing for kids' interests that um, people have begun to recognize that um, the key thing is to, is to let children read the things that they really enjoy in the hope that it will turn them up to reading, and then maybe they'll discover the classics afterwards. Whereas in the past, the idea was, these are the classics, you must read them and sort of live up to them. And that's really strange. That's very interesting. Um, I guess a really basic question that comes to mind is, you know, why does make-believe matter? You know, what, what's important as in children growing up that their imaginations be fed? Question to either of you. Well, I think if you didn't, you'd just wither away and be sad and fall over dead, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, we all daydream and dream. And I mean, I think for children, I mean, if you, if you had to be contained like a bonsai all the time, you would grow up really weird. You know, you would be an unpleasant person. I mean, we don't know what sleep does, and we don't know what dreams are for. But it's some important thing, because if you stop people from doing it, they die. <coughs> so, you know, just because we don't know doesn't mean it isn't important. And one thing I'd like to add is that um, a few years ago, I interviewed a number of writers of fantasy. And I came to that project as someone who had grown up uh, reading nonfiction um, as a child. That was what I was drawn to. So I was kind of mm -hmm. coming as a, work, as a writer as a person from another world, a world of nonfiction, to try to understand what, what compelled these other writers to, to do fantasy. And what I discovered is many of them um, had grown up um, or been involved as soldiers in World War II. And for them, people like Lloyd Alexander and Susan Cooper um, and Madeline Langle, for them, fantasy was a way of speaking about the unspeakable. Um, it was about this way of writing about experiences that would have been too hard or too elusive. Um, to write about in, in a, what we call more realistic terms. And so I think what I learned from that was that, whereas the cliche about fantasy is that it's escapist, it's you know, getting away from what matters. In fact, it can be the best way of getting at what matters. 
for a lot of people. Thank you so much. I'm afraid we're out of time. So Leonard and Audrey will be signing books, and perhaps you can flip into the questions. Thank you both.